And I think if you just do the exact opposite of what you're used to, it's amazing how you build that money muscle. And, uh, and it's never not worked out that way for us. We've always made it happen with whatever investment we've done. Hey babes, it's Kayla Craft with the Mommy Millionaire Podcast. I'm a mom of three littles, ER nurse turned self-made millionaire and lifestyle entrepreneur. I am bringing you inspiring stories, business and mindset tips to help you be shameless in pursuing your ambitions. Hey, Mommy Millionaires, and welcome to the Mommy Millionaire Podcast. I am so excited about today's special guest. You guys heard her husband just a couple weeks ago, Ray Higdon. And you know, there's the special woman next to him that is helping him build that empire. And I am so excited for you guys to learn from her today. So make sure to take massive amounts of notes and to share this out with your friends who are in network marketing. So Welcome, Jessica, to the show. Thank you, Kayla. I'm so excited to be here. By the way, I'm so jealous of your branding name. That's such an awesome name. I love it. (laughs) It's very catchy. Yes, very catchy. (laughs) And it, it also makes some people mad, which was the point of it. Because I'm like, that's why we need to have this conversation. Because... You know, so many people are living paycheck to paycheck. And I think me and you are both on the same mission. Like, we want to help more people have financial abundance. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to have you on the show. But I want to, I want my um, listeners to get a chance to get to know who Jessica used to be before building rank makers and all of those amazing things that you've created. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I, when I first started in like a home business, I was only 21. So transitioning from, you know, uh, being a full-time marketing student and also working full-time and having uh, a full-time um, makeup business as well that I was trying to start on the side at like 19, 20 years old, I was like burnt out and just, you know, broke as ever because I was in college, but didn't really care that much about you know, what was going to happen with my future until I started learning more about this whole like model of having a home business and being able to work from home and utilize social media to to build. And then I thought, Hmm, you know what? I'll give this a try. And kind of the rest is history. So I feel like I've been an entrepreneur my whole life almost, like just trying different things, even in high school and even in middle school, like selling what I called locker lockets, which were these like little magnet hearts that stuck to your locker and you could put things in in middle school. But then, you know, transitioned into business and then transitioned from business into family life. So, like pre. You know, our company now, our training company now, it was really just me grinding, building my home business and, and trying to make that work on social media. And then like the biggest transition for me, I think personally as a woman, has been from going from like super driven, super motivated for business to mom life, mm. um, which is why I'm so excited to be on your podcast because that was like the biggest transition for me. Mm. I feel like a lot of people struggle with that and then they have like guilt over, you know, wanting to build a business and be a good mom at the same time. Like, how do you struggle? I mean, do you struggle with that? Absolutely. I think, (laughs) I think every good, good mom does, right? We all have that guilt, but I've learned to let that go, especially with my my first, like right now, your listeners probably don't know, but I'm very pregnant. I'm eight months pregnant and I'm looking forward to where, which as before I was a little nervous to go into like full mom mode, but I'm looking forward to this time being just being a mom for, Mm. you know, however long that means to me, whether that's three months or six months or even a year or multiple years. For me, I get a little like crazy after about a year. I just want to go back to work and and start business and, you know, do that. But I it's definitely hard to balance the two. And I never knew what busy meant until I had kids. And so having that first and 
transitioning from like, all I do is business to now, like I'm just full-time mom. It was hard for me to let that go, especially with all the societal pressure put on women today of you have to be at all. You have to do everything. You have to be a go-getter and, you know, a mom and a wife and all, and all these things. And really when I just released that and said, you know, I'm just comfortable and happy and excited to share that I'm just a mom right now versus feeling guilt or feeling like it's a bad word or something bad. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of that just anxiety and guilt changed for me. Well, it sounds like you just have like, you've accepted the season you're in, in life. And, um, I think a lot of people struggle with acceptance of, and you know, like the season that they're in is actually a gift to them, whether it's like, okay, right now I'm going to be a full-time wife or right now it's full-time mom or right now it's full-time businesswoman, like hear me roar, right? Um, what do you say to somebody that is struggling with that right now? Like they, they're in a season that they feel they're happy in, but they're like, oh, I should be doing something else. I should be adding something else onto my plate. Anytime. And I still, and it's such a great question because I still go there. I still go to that place of, oh, I should be doing this. I think everybody does, but I have accepted the season I'm in. And I, what an exercise that helps me is I look at 10 years from now and what I'll remember today. And what I'll remember today is you know, playing with my three-year-old or, you know, the fact that she drove me crazy with potty training and I'll laugh about it later. Um, I won't remember, uh, at least I hope I won't <laughs> and hold on to this, but I won't remember, you know, the employee that was driving me crazy that, um, you know, we had to let go, or I won't remember the, um, you know, the, the interview that I missed because I had a baby that was spitting up or sick. So those are the things I won't remember, but I look at 10 years down the road and say, what will I remember? What will I wish I was more present with? And that's what I try to hold on to every day. And I think it is very different for, for men versus women. That's just my opinion in that we are to our core, you know, we're nurturers. We're, we are meant to be those nurturers. And so the things that are important to us sometimes vary even if you're super motivated and driven, you can do everything and be it all, but just make sure that you're hanging on to what's, what's something you're going to look back at and say, yes, I'm so glad that I stayed present for those moments. Hmm. I love that advice. I just wrote that down. Okay. Awesome. So you're married to somebody that is very ambitious, driven. And how do you guys, how do you guys co- like not exist. I mean, you're, you're doing more than coexisting. You're, <laughs> you know, like how do you, cause I feel like you're, if you're that person too, and then now you are the stay at home, you know, not stay at home mom, but you're at home with the kids pregnant. How, how do you deal with that? Is it still just going back to that question? What will I remember? Or do you get annoyed? Do you get jealous? Like, you know, what are those feelings and how do you deal with it? Ugh, I love that you asked this because I don't think there's a woman on the planet who doesn't get jealous of their husband's ability to walk away from kid life. Like <laughs> we just talked about that. I know, <laughs> like, right? uh, you know, I love my children or my child soon to be children more than anything. And I have two stepchildren as well who I love, but they're older now. But the fact that I can walk, can't walk away at certain times when Ray can is just it does. It makes me a little crazy sometimes. Um, and I do get a little jealous because I do, I am a producer and I do need to feel like I'm making a difference in business um, as well. And so, yes, for six months at a time, I can accept being full on mom. But when I get into, or like a year, like with Sabrina, I was able to take a full year, which I know a lot of women can't do that. And there are women that are totally meant to be a hundred percent moms. Like they are amazing at that. And every woman's different, right? But for me, like when I see Ray, who is extremely driven and loves what he does and works a lot, it I get that feeling of neglect sometimes or that feeling of jealousy. But I realize that that's really just me and something in my 
world isn't being fulfilled. And I need Mm -hmm. to figure out what that is because he is like the most loving, the most amazing and giving husband on the planet. And when he is present with me, he's fully present and he's got to do what he's got to do. So with me, it's like, okay, what I look back and I reflect on what am I not getting out of today? Or what am I not getting out of this experience right now with my kids? Like, is it that I'm bored? And let's just talk about that. Sometimes, you know, playing with your kids can be boring. (laughs) (laughs) You love them to death, but like that, that playtime sometimes can be like, okay, I'm done playing Barbies now. What is that of today? And how do I make it fun for them and bring them into my world and say, okay, like this is what mommy wants to do now and let's go do something fun, like go to the playground or do a physical activity. And then I kind of let those feelings go. But I don't think there's a woman on the planet who doesn't experience that. And it's just part of being a mom. And again, later down the road, I think you'll be, you'll happy. be glad that you were able mm-hmm. to do that. I love that. So take inventory basically. Like why, why do I feel this way? What's going on inside of me that's making me feel this. Yeah, exactly. What, why am I feeling unfulfilled right now? Because Mm. it really, rarely does it have anything to do with him. Mm, I love that. Oh, okay. So let's talk business because I'm obsessed with business. I know you are too. And you primarily help network marketers, right? I think that's, I mean, that's basically your whole entire business is helping network marketers rank advance. Yeah. Yeah. The principles we teach are really applicable to any business, but we our background is that we built our positions to the top income earners in a company utilizing social media. And so we just started a a small training company doing that just kind of on the side while we were building our home business. And that training company teaching people how to do that ended up really taking over our lives and, and growing very, very fast, hit Inc. 5000 and Entrepreneur 360 and just grew and grew and grew and still is to this day. So we actually retired from network marketing to focus on coaching and training because it was very clear and obvious that the universe was telling us this is where we were meant to focus and be. So that's mainly what we do and and we love it. What do you feel like is the number one struggle that people are experiencing when it comes to you know, going to that next level in business? I can just tell you from personal experience and working with a lot of a lot of big earners is their money mindset. You would think it's like lack of tactics or lack of skill sets, but all of that is hireable or googleable or whatever that that verbiage is. I would say it's their their money mindset. Mm. People who are afraid to invest in themselves and their business, people who are scared that if they release that they'll be they'll shrink instead of grow people who just can't see for themselves that first big paycheck or you know maybe it's their first $500 they just can't see it for themselves so they never get to that point or that first million dollars or whatever that means to you if you improve your money mindset not just overall mindset but your money mindset and what you'll allow and what you believe is possible then it's amazing how your business starts to thrive Oh my gosh, I totally agree. When you first started in your home based business at 21, what was your money mind- mindset like? Like, what were some of your limiting beliefs? Well, when I uh, was little, my mom was actually bipolar, and I saw her go from, and she's perfectly healthy now, she's great, but I saw her go from, you know, having a ton of money and being very comfortable to having like spending and having nothing, losing everything to the point where we were living in cars. And, and so my money mindset came from that in that I, and still to this day, I struggle with it. I don't think it's something that goes away no matter how much money you make, you just have to adapt. But I, my money mindset was, I have this ins- had this insatiable fear that I would make a bunch of have a bunch of success, make a bunch of money, and then lose everything. Like that to me was the ultimate failure, more so than becoming successful, or more so than staying where I was, like staying in a, like a failure place. If I had become successful and then failed, that was the ultimate embarrassment for me. So what that did was it kind of sabotaged me. Whenever I would see a little bit of success, I would either spend my money or focus on something that was bad for the business or 
divert my attention elsewhere and not be consistent because I was scared of that success versus the failure. If I had just stayed where I was and continued being where I'm at, then nobody could say, oh my gosh, I can't believe she made all this money and then lost everything. What's wrong with her? You know, like you hear about these ball players and people mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that was really my mindset. And again, I still, even though we're doing very well, I still struggle with that. No matter how well you do, you just have to learn your triggers and how to overcome that. So what is a tool that you use to basically be constantly working on that? Something that I've adopted really in the last year that's helped me tremendously is actually two things. Um, I should say the last two years. And our business has just grown tremendously from this as well, which is kind of interesting. One is giving more. So giving more to charities, giving more of my time to charities and, and seeing the effects of what that giving is doing. When you put in perspective where you're at versus where you could be and really hold that gratitude, that's helped me a lot. And number two, which they kind of coincide, you would think giving more, like giving is my problem, right? Or, or spending is my problem. I, I can't, I need to hoard that money because I'm scared to lose it all is doing the exact opposite of whatever my mind instantly tells me to do. So my first reaction, if there's a big expense, and it's probably usually with this reaction, it's for big time coaching expense or some kind of advertising expense or anything like that. My first reaction is don't do it. I get sweaty. My palms get sweaty. My heart starts racing. Instead, I've been taking a deep breath and thinking the exact opposite and doing the exact opposite. Mm. So doing it right away and saying to myself, this is going to be amazing. This is going to net us 10 times what we're putting into it. This is going to make us, you know, so much more money and we're going to be so much more comfortable and secure. Instead saying that to myself and doing it right away versus tensing up, having to think about it, hemming and hawing, wondering what bad is going to come from doing these things. And I think if you just do the exact opposite of what you're used to, it's amazing how you build that money muscle. And, uh, and it's never not worked out that way for us. We've always made it happen with whatever investment we've done. Mm. I love that. The Okay. If something happens and you're sweaty, you're going to just like, okay, let me do the exact opposite. Instead of anxiety taking over right now, let me feel empowered. And I think taking a deep breath is always one way to like bring you back into the present moment and realize, okay, like I have better tools. I know better than this. What do I need to be thinking? I love that advice. Absolutely. And I remember um, like when I first started, I was only 23 too. And I kind of had a similar childhood as you, which I think is interesting because people that struggled a lot when they were child, when they were child, when they were children, I feel like they end up being some of the most driven people because they know what it's like to not have anything. And right. And then you get a little taste of having something and you're like, I like that life better. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to keep that life. Yeah. And one of the things that's helped me with money mindset is just knowing like at the end of the day, like even if I make a bad investment, let's say, let's go to worst case scenario. Like I will always bet on myself. I will always be able to recover that because no money is actually lost. It's always making its way back to me. And I just always like do that visualization. And like just the other day, Chase and I, we do a lot of investing and um, we found out the money we invested is it's just gone. It's 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 uh, it didn't work out. That investment didn't work out. And it's gone now. <laughs> yeah. And my mindset instantly was like, oh my gosh, we lost sixty thousand dollars and my heart sank and I was just like, oh like I'm so angry. I'm so mad. And I was like, okay, wait, what would the highest version of Kayla do when something like this happened? And I was like, oh my gosh. Well actually the sixty thousand dollars wasn't buried in the oil drill. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it's not gone. It's coming back. It's coming back to me. You know, it went into people's hands and, you know, that made that drill and all these things, you know, and so it made me feel better. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm evolving because I was able to get over it in like 10 minutes instead of like a couple of years ago, that would have probably made me like depressed for a week. (laughs) So amazing. um, I love that story. 
Yeah. I think that, and I think it's important that like we share that it's still a work in progress. Like you're not going to, you know, work on it when you're 21 and then be in your forties and still be recovered. Like it's something you're going to constantly be going through because every new level is going to bring new resistance with it. So, um, I love that you're open and that you're vulnerable saying, Hey, I'm still going through it, but here's some of the things that I do. So, I. Uh, one of the things that network marketers, I feel like, get a really bad rap for is reaching out to their friends and family and bugging them. And do you hear that fear a lot? Like, I want to do network marketing, but I'm just so scared. I don't want to bug my friends and family. Oh, all the time. All the time. And our response to that is you shouldn't bug your fans, friends and family. <laughs> Actually, you shouldn't even go to them unless... And maybe Ray talked about this on the last podcast with you, but you shouldn't even go to them unless you have you know, you have some kind of update or you're not, you do not care whether they join or not. Mm. So many people go to their friends and family with this begging attitude or this attitude of, I have to get them to join or, you know, if they don't join, I've, I've done all this, this and that for them. And they expect them to join their business. And that is totally one of the reasons why network marketers get a bad rap is because they're trained improperly to just go hammer their friends and family. No, you have there was something that made you join your company. So you have a product or service that you really believe in, whether it's a story or a person that you related to, there was something. So you have the goods, you have this golden nugget in your hand, this golden ticket that you can do whatever you want to do with, make as much as you want to make. There is no limit. But if you go to them with, hey, you need to join me or guilt them into it or beg them, they're not going to see it that way. All they're going to see is, oh man, here comes Pitchy McPitcherson again. <laughs> but if you go to them down the road with a, hey, like if you want to take a look at this and try it out, this is what it did for me. Great. If not, no big deal. And you truly do not care whether they join or not. That's when you should go, go to your friends and family. And my story is a great example. I went to my friends and family in the beginning. They all said pyramid. They all said it wouldn't work. They were skeptical. And I just kept doing it anyway. Hmm. Well, when I hit my first $10,000 a month, guess who joined? The friends my and brother. family. Oh, <laughs> all the friends, my brothers, my mom, my dad started making spreadsheets of telling me how if I get this many people in, then this is what my team will look like in you know a couple of months and getting all into it. So just know that no doesn't mean no forever. It means no right now, but you can't beg anyone to do anything with that type of posture, whether it's your family or your friends and expect them not to think of you that way. How would you think of a person that way? It doesn't yeah. matter if network marketing or or whatever it is. Real estate doesn't matter. Totally. So how do you get that posture where you're you're unattached to the outcome and you're confident about what you're offering to the world? Like how do you build up that posture muscle? I'm a big believer in that that's not going to come until you practice out in the field. It's mm. just not. You can read all about posture. You can go get a bunch of books, listen to a bunch of audios, and it'll help. But until you get out in the field and start actually talking to people and prospecting and getting rejected and have a slew of prospects in your pipeline that you know some are interested, some are yeses, some are noes, that posture is just going to build. It's just a muscle that you're going to get over time. It's kind of like pilots. We have a good friend that's a pilot and he relates it to um, their training simulators. They do literally hundreds of hours of training on what to do when you're in a crash or when, when your plane is going down. Hundreds of hours of training. But as soon as they get into that simulator and they're actually simulating the crash, they, the first 25 times they freak out. They don't know what to do, even though they've studied it hundreds of times. It takes them a good 25, 30 times of being in the simulator and actually putting it into practice where they understand how to do it and they can be a pilot. They can get their license. So it's the same thing in our business or in any sales position. Just going out there, talking to people, getting hit a few times, punched in the face, which we've all been there if we're in sales, and learning to get over that, that you build that posture. And then 
um, you know, you, we have some success stories as well. Mm. I 100% agree with that. And I mean, I always say this, every master was once a disaster. And so knowing, yeah, yeah, you, you know that going into it, like everybody, you have to be willing to look dumb to get made fun of in the beginning. And uh, eventually you figure it out over time. You go, okay, that didn't work. That didn't work. That didn't work. This does. <laughs> totally. So, you know, when you're training people and everybody probably asks you, you know, what's, what's the secret? What's the secret? And you're, you're saying the secret is money mindset. What is like a system that you think is very powerful for people listening in right now that are developing a team? You know, so they've had some success and they have people that are looking to them for their leadership. And sometimes teaching money mindset isn't easily duplicated, right? Because you're not going to be able to coach one on one and find out everybody's like limiting beliefs and help them, you know, transform. So what would you say is a good system for helping somebody like that's building a team, help their team with money mindset? That was a long loaded question. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so tools, I mean, the, the less that in our industry, you know, cause there is no, I don't think for money mindset or really anybody's problem, there's one size fits all, right? Because there's different companies, there's different people struggling with different things, they're at different places in their life. And in our industry, um, if you're building a team, what the best things that duplicate are tools. If you're not the one creating everything, or you have an amazing training that you video that everybody can use as a tool maybe. But if you're not the one creating everything, it's even better because then they feel like, oh, well, she didn't even have to do that and I don't either. So I would honestly just find a tool that you really love that helped you, that you can create a story around with your money mindset and share that with your people and maybe do you know a call around that once a week or, or um, talk about that. But I wouldn't make it so like you leader focused that people are depending on you to get them over their money mindset. And a lot of times you can teach people how to be successful, but you can't teach them to want to be successful. Mm. And so if you're focusing on like training your people about money mindset all the time and it's just not resonating, then that's okay. They're just at different places in their life. And it's probably an indicator that you know, that's not where you need to be. Oh my gosh. I am so glad that you brought this up because I think that's the fastest way that somebody burns out in network marketing um, and building a team in general is getting people that are dead to come alive. And you know what I mean? It's easier to give birth than raise the dead. Go out and get new people that want it. And so many people get stuck on, well, she told me six months ago that she would die for this. And now she won't answer her phone. And I just keep calling and I keep calling. I'm like, why are you trying to beat a dead horse? Like it's, it's done. What do you say to those people? Well, first of all, um, there's this kind of shift happening in the training industry and profession where it's shifting from like sell, 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 sell to keep, 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 keep which is very needed and very, very important. Um, So there's two thoughts, thought processes here. There's the just love people where they're at because you beating them to death. And like you said, beating a dead horse is not going to do anything for them. If anything, it's just going to make them feel bad and leave. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's that culture piece where you really need to learn that your best uh, income comes from mainly customers. So if people just want to be a customer or just want to get in one or two people or whatever, then that's great. Make them feel good because that's your residual income right there. But also to that point, you want to work with the people who are working, not the people who are, you have to constantly motivate or, or tell them how much you believe in them all the time. Those are not the people right now that are going to build your business. So you want to find those people that are going to work. And if you're not bringing new blood into the business, then that's exactly what's going to duplicate. The more people that you're bringing in and the more that you're showing up for your own business, the more that your team will as well of those who are ready. But you have to balance you know, the the people who are just excited to be a part of the team and love the community and the culture versus the workers who, you know, are going to 
lock arms with you and go to work. I love that. So what it, what's working on social media right now when it comes to getting people to buy your product or service? A um, couple of different things. I mean, there's so much working. I, I'm a big believer and there's a million ways to make a million dollars. So mm-hmm. if you have, if you're listening to this and you have something that's working, don't stop that and do something else because you heard me say this, but you stories are huge right now on Instagram and Facebook and getting people to reach out to you. So the great thing about stories is you can take polls, you can do text stories and ask questions and get people reaching out to you. So for example, if you're in health and wellness and you have a gut health product, let's say, you might take a problem that people struggle with with gut health like, you know, energy or fogginess, brain fog, and say in a poll or say in a text story, hey, who out there, are, are, are you struggling with brain fog right now? Yes or no? And see how many people vote yes and reach out to those people and offer them a solution, right? So little, little tweaks and things like that are really awesome to think about, thinking a little outside the box of what your product can do and who your audience is. Another thing that's working on social media that's worked for years and years and years and is how I built my business even 10 years ago when Facebook didn't even have groups or anything like that is just hitting your numbers every single day. Mm-hmm. And I think people, they get away from that because of all the fancy things you can do, like stories, like posts, like hashtags, like all the fun things you can do. They get away from the core set of rules, which is hit your numbers every single day, actively prospect every single day, go out and talk to somebody, go out and bring someone from cold to warm. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I first built, I didn't have any fancy schmancy gadgets on social media. It was, okay, there's a lot of people on here. I'm going to talk to as many as I can that I resonate with and bring them into my business. Oh my gosh. That's it. And and the way that you built was how I built because my build was eight years ago. So I'm actually writing my entire book on that concept is the consistency is what matters. It's not how it's in the what. So, so yeah, I love that you're still teaching people that basic concept because people, they think, oh, I'll go all out on stories, you know, one day a week and that's going to be enough. And it's like, no, it matters what you're doing every single day. Like I didn't even take Christmas off for the first three years. And I'm not saying people have to hustle that way, but I built to, I was, you know, working as an ER nurse, plus I was an instructor at a college. So I had to be very structured and, and the numbers were everything. It was 12 actions every single day that I was doing in order to, you know, reach a million dollars in three years. So, um, I think that, yeah, I love that, that you're giving that structure and you're giving people actual practical do polls. I mean, find out what people are really struggling with and get to know them instead of just sell them right away. Cause I see so many people just posting pictures of their health and wellness supplements or their, you know, their gut health stuff. And I'm like, that's not what, what are you doing? Like, that's not even, that doesn't work at all. You know, yeah. <laughs> I love that you say that we had a client, this is really funny and they'll appreciate me sharing this, but we had a client that um, literally thought the key to their success in their business was to take pictures of their essential oils in cool places. So they would drive to like the beach and set up their essential oils in front of the ocean, like take it with that in the background, like the, the oils were a model or something, or they put them, you know, in front of the, the they'd superimpose them in front of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> just, oh just my really- gosh. Aw. I mean, it's creative. It's thinking, you know, outside of the box, but it's taking the customer out of the equation and the customer is the most important part of the equation. So I love that. Uh, I think on like social media, people get so caught up in the likes and the comments and the like outward appearance of, you know, really what social media wasn't intended to be in the first place. Like social media was meant to connect people. How do you help people get over that little hump of, oh my gosh, that picture that had an amazing story that I posted about how these products were going to help this customer. It only got one like. How do, you, how do you help people get over not caring about that? Well, again, it's just talking about our story and our journey. 
like where we came from. I think people will listen to you and follow what you say if they feel like you can relate to them and you've been where they are. And we have, we all had to start somewhere, right? So just like you were sharing, you know, you had to start at the bottom and work your way up. And same with us, you know, we had to start with no likes, no, nobody knew us. I was 21, no business experience. Nobody cared what I had to say to, you know, making a a nice life for ourselves and a great lifestyle. So I think that, uh, that you really just share the story of where you were and keep, reminding people that it's not going to happen overnight. Any overnight success stories you hear besides winning the lottery are people who didn't share with you their background before that, because most people have to go through a lot of struggle to get to where they are. And frankly, if it, the thing that we tell people is if it were easy, then it wouldn't be worth it because everybody would be millionaires. Everybody would have, you know, the nice cars and be able to, just spend all day with their kids and it wouldn't be special. So the fact that you have to go through the struggle is what makes it worth it. Mm. Well, I, I love that. And it's like the struggle builds character. And that's the most powerful thing about building any type of business is the person that you become after um, is someone so much stronger, someone so much more capable, someone that has more impact on the world. And so, um, yeah, the struggle is completely 100% worth it. And I love that, you, that you're sharing. Like, You can't compare your beginning to somebody's middle, basically. I love that. Totally. Hmm. So what, is, what's, what are you excited about right now? Ooh, um, so many things. We have a big event coming up in October that I'm really excited about. So it'll be our biggest event ever, Rank Makers Live. Um, that's October 3rd through 5th. And that's exciting. Plus, uh, obviously, I have a baby coming <laughs> here in the next month. So, um, you know, I'm And just- you're going to be with the baby at that event, I just realized. Like yes. a six week old. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I'll be able to even walk at that point. So it'll be, (laughs) but, uh, but I'm showing up, I'm going to be there and, uh, and it'll be great. So that's awesome. Okay. So who is the event for, for network marketers, obviously. Yes. Um, really. So we have a group that is called rank makers and we've got over 14,000 people in there. Um, that where where my husband goes live every single day, we give a training and an action step. And uh, it's just a great community. So this is our first Rank Makers Live event, Social Media Super Summit. So this is really for for anybody who is in network marketing or a home business or just wanting to learn social media strategies that wants to be a part of a community that is growing and excited and holds you accountable. That's that's really what we're we're working on here. And so a lot of those people are going to be recognized and celebrated. And we have some great speakers as well uh, coming to that event that are social media superstars and can give you some some good tips. Awesome. Okay. And are you active on social media still? I'm assuming you are. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Where's your favorite place to hang out? Um, I just love Instagram now. So my Instagram <laughs> handle is Jessica Higdon 99. If anybody wants to look me up. Okay. And then I always ask people, what is the most shameless thing you did to build your business? Let me think about this. So when I was building my business, again, I mean, if we're still building our businesses, right? But when I was first building and was very broke and needed to make it happen no matter what, I was very young and naive. And so at that time, like social media was just starting to kind of be a thing, but home meetings were the thing. Mm -hmm. So the homes that I went into to build, like I remember I went to this house where it was all guys. Um, They were clearly not interested in the business and all they wanted to do was get do shots and and like they were I walked in and they were smoking joints and the only thing that I'm trying to do is the presentation and so like I had a lot of those type of experiences where I didn't care who you were or what you look like or what you did or where you lived I would go to your house and do a presentation I love that 
pretty dumb. (laughs) Not smart at all. (laughs) Well, you know what? You were hungry. And I think that's what's missing from a lot of people is like, they're not willing to do whatever it takes. And you were like, you know, whatever it takes. They told me to talk to 120 people a day. So I'm fine. I'm talking to anybody that has a heartbeat. And, you know, then now you don't have to do those things. You've learned better, right? The law of attraction and all that kind of stuff is at play now. But in the beginning, I mean, you have to just show that you're hungry. And then I feel like God will bring the right people into your life. And so um, I love that. I absolutely love that. Because the tagline of our podcast is to be shameless in pursuing your ambitions. And that's exactly what you were. And I just want to share more stories like that because people don't see. We've all done, we've all done silly things. Every master was once a disaster. So you got to go out there and be shameless in getting what you guys want. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I learned a ton from you and I cannot wait to, you know, for the Mommy Millionaire community to hear about you. And I can't wait to see your baby boy be born in just a couple of weeks. And we're sending you lots of just massive love and hugs into the last, you know, couple of weeks of this journey with you. So... Well, thank you. I'm honored to be on here. I can't wait to interview you as well and learn more about you. So hopefully uh, that'll be here shortly and just appreciate you having me on and being able to share with your awesome community that you've created. Yay. All right. You guys know the drill. Uh, if you loved this podcast, which I know you did, take a screenshot and tag both me and Jessica and share with us what you learned. And if you guys have any friends that are in the network marketing industry and you're like, they have to listen to this episode. She gives so many little good nuggets. Grab the link and text it out to 10 people. And you guys know what we're doing. For every single week that you do this, you will be entered in to win a ticket to Mommy Millionaire Live that's also in October. And uh, we're going to just give back to you because we're all about uh, sharing the love. So you guys can email info at mommymillionaire.co and show proof that you've texted it to 10 of your friends and you'll be entered in to win that ticket. Thanks you guys so much for listening and stay tuned for the recap. Thank you for listening to the Mommy Millionaire podcast. For free resources and materials, head over to mommymillionaire.co. Make sure to follow Mommy Millionaire on Spotify and subscribe on iTunes. And it would mean the world to me if you left a five-star review of the show. And as always, ladies, go out there and get what you want.